it just would have been a different character. You know, that's my thing. I had a college professor. Never mind. I'm not going to go. That's boring. I was going to start talking about Hamlet and Paris. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Definitely do not talk. There's going to be a bonus right pod. About, <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Zach Gilford's Stay Hamilton. Stay tuned if you uh, really want to hear uh, that. No, Hamlet. <laughs> Zach Gilford's Hamlet. Yeah, Zach Gilford's Hamilton is also a much different thing. Uh, well, enough yeah. talk about Zach Gilford's uh, Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> you do not want to see me do Hamilton. <laughs> no, I don't think I, don't I, want- I do. Hello, everybody. This is Scott Porter, and you are listening to It's Not Only Football, Friday Night Lights and Beyond. Uh, with myself, Scott Porter, I play Jason Street on Friday Night Lights, and here with me today are... Uh, what up? I'm Zach Gelford. I played Matt Saracen. And I'm Mae Whitman. I wasn't on the show, but I am the number one fan of Friday Night Lights, and so I'm here to keep these two in check. A lot of people out there might want to challenge you to that number one fan of Shouldn't the show. Shouldn't be a problem. Should not be a problem. Well, you're here, and they're not. <laughs> That's right. So. You got a co-host gig, so right? <laughs> you win. Thank you. Um, here on this particular podcast, we are going to be going through the entire series of Friday Night Lights, episode by episode, but we're going to be taking little detours and little breaks here and there and talking about just life in general, because Friday Night Lights and beyond. That's the beyond part. We're not going to just be talking to people who are involved in the show or people who are on the show, as you can see from May sitting across <laughs> from me right now. And we want to talk to as many people out there as possible and see how this show affected a lot of other people, including someone like May. Uh, who was drawn to the show from not being inside the filming process, but from watching from afar. Yeah. I mean, you know, actors are fans of things too, Scott and Zach. Uh, we <laughs> like Sorry, things I didn't as well. to suggest <laughs> that you weren't a fan <laughs> he of He was anything. giving me a look. You couldn't tell. Um, you know, uh, yeah, the multiverse, I think, of Friday Night Lights is big. Is, multi- is that what a multiverse is? Yeah. Okay, good. Sure. I, I don't know superhero, but I was, I'm checking with our resident superhero uh, <laughs> expert, Scott Porter. Um, it's, it's a big multiverse. That's uh, it's. I think the reach is obviously very far and wide is not even just in the industry but you know and I think something being on a show like Parenthood which was created by Jason Kadams who also created your show um I think it sort of connects us in a way that we are all kind of one big family and not just because, you know, there was so much crossover. But I think, you know, one thing we always said about Parenthood, which I feel the same way about Friday Night Lights, is that it's amazing when you can make a a show that the big things are just life. It's not explosions. It's not car crashes. It's not murders. It's not there's like all these huge things. But it's just life and it's just family and it's because those things are huge. And if you portray them the right way, people kind of really connect to them. And I think, you know, what something that we got a lot, the fan feedback we got a lot was this your show made me feel less alone because of, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever part you kind of related to. um, You know, we were tackling these issues that I think people could really relate to and they felt like they were part of the family. So I think that's another big thing that we wanted to do with this podcast is just that everybody that's either either connected to this show because they were on it or because they weren't but they loved it it's it feels like you're all a part of one big family and so i think i'm here to kind of like represent the outer family that you guys created uh in the inner world and so you know i'm here to be that extra voice that i can ask you guys all the fan stuff and kind of geek out on you (laughs) yeah it's not only football it's community right it's the town it's, it's family yeah okay so we don't know why Zach is here, but he's I've, gonna try I, to pretend I'm, to make I, up a reason. I'm a strong believer that brevity is a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> is so, that a personal attack? No. Um all right, so should we get into the pilot about how, how do we want to do this? Yeah, I mean if it's not just... if it's not only football, then what is it, you guys? <laughs> well <laughs> I think before we Funny jump you into should the ask. pilot <laughs> <laughs> I, I think before we jump into the pilot we can talk about like what happened, you know, before that. We in in episode zero of yes. It's Not Only Football, which if you haven't heard it, go back and take a little listen. Uh, we talked about how Zach and I came to be a part of the show, our casting process and all of those things. Uh, we talked about you know May's deep love for the show mm-hmm. and being a part of the Kadams verse. Mm-hmm. How about that? Is That's that a good. Multiverse? The Kadams sure. verse? Yeah. Um, and her deep love and appreciation also for Taylor Kitsch. Yeah. Um, He's he's not here today. He will be here. My dad actually texted me about three minutes ago and said, because I sent a picture, and he said, where's where's uh, Tim Riggins? And I was like, Dad, that's going to be a, that's not, you know, and I mean, it's so <laughs> yeah, we absurd. we don't want to blow our load early. No, we can't blow our load early. That's, we got to build up to that. And even my mom texted me like two days ago, I told Zach this already, but, and literally just a screenshot of her Googling 
is Taylor Kitsch single? And it just was like results of is <laughs> if Taylor. I was like, Mom, what? You can't do this. But I was happy to know that uh, it says that he is. Not that everything on the internet you read is true, but, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> now, back to the pilot. It's it's pretty awesome. Am I right? I think, it's, yeah, it's definitely a special piece of television, especially for a pilot. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget I got a copy of it slipped to me a little early from someone. And I was in New York with my best friend who I lived source. with. Who's your source? He told me never to tell, and I still won't. Who's your source? (laughs) Uh, But we got to watch it early, and I'm watching it. You know, I'm like this 23-year-old dude in New York, and my buddy and I, and we're in our apartment, and we watch it. And when it ended, we were kind of quiet for a second. He just looked at me and goes, can we watch it again? Wow. And I was like, oh, that's that's a good compliment. You know what? Actually, this is is great. so you saw it in New York, and mm-hmm. you saw it a little bit early. Where did you watch the pilot? Yeah, I was going to say I've written down. Oh, did you Lord. watch it live? Such or a good question. I don't later? think I did watch it live. But then again, I'm like, when would I have watched it then? I guess I just DVR'd it and then watched it on TiVo for well, those Well, I guess that's my question. Were you who... watching it while it was airing, not necessarily live, or did you find it years later? No, Netflix? I was watching it. I was watching it while it was airing. Um, and on I think... Tuesday nights against American Idol. You're right. I was watching American Idol. Okay, so sue me. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I'm more of a voice gal, of uh, the voice gal. Uh, but um, no, I, I, you know, and again, you know, we were on NBC as well. Parenthood was. Wait, isn't the voice? A, isn't that an NBC show? Of course. You, you're, so you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're a company. I said you're a company I'm a individual. company gal. I stick with my people. Uh, listen, I got to be on the Voice. Okay, laugh it up. But I got to Carson Daly came up to me and Retta, who he called Rita, and did like a little sting, and he said Rita, and we died laughing. And he could tell he didn't even remember my name at all. It was amazing. But I got to be on The Voice for five seconds. It was very cool. Um, but no, I watched it. You know, I. But again, for those of you who are uh, age that is younger than we are, uh, we had you know DVRs and TiVo, and you would. It was so exciting because you could record the thing, and then you could zoom through the commercials. And so I remember having them all stacked up on my DVR. Just to be clear, you can still do that. But nobody does. I was talking about. <laughs> T- remember when TiVo? It was like, oh, TiVo. Am oh. I right? You know I, I do. Mean? I still yeah, have DVR. It was I haven't cut the cord yet. Oh, go ahead. The point <laughs> is I had them stacked up on my DVR and I was like, ha I'm cheating the system. I was an early binger, if you will, of, um, of the television show. I, I watched it with my family back home in Orlando. I had never done like basically a spec of television that had aired. I had done like a, a four episode stint on uh, a soap opera and I had done like <laughs> this other CW show called Bedford Diaries, but it hadn't aired yet before my family saw Friday Night Lights. And we saw it all together. My sister was born on my 15th birthday. My brother was born when I was 18. So they're much, much younger than me. Uh, I think my brother was like seven years old and we all watched it together. And after Street's injury, which we'll, we'll get to next pod, uh, he got up and walked out of the room crying. And to be, he was seven and was very, very affected. My mom went and she said, what's going on? He goes, I do not want to watch this anymore. And I said, I said, Bren, what's going on, buddy? And he goes, Scotty died. And I was like, no, 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 no. I didn't die. But it, it was the beginning of a new journey for street. But that journey started before we ever sh- shot the pilot. I, I went to Austin, Texas three and a half weeks early. I got a panicked phone call uh, from our first assistant director on the show, uh, Casey Haddenfeld, who actually did the pilot with us. And Casey reached out and said, hey, uh, I know we cast you uh, like a month ago, but can you throw a football? I was going to ask who could actually play, who was the best, who was the worst. Like, what was that setting that up? I'm not going to tell you that was the worst, but it was not me. Uh, uh, No, 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 no. (laughs) Uh, There were some of us who had had played football before. Jesse Plemons is actually a really yeah. solid athlete, uh, two-sport kid from Mark, Texas. Uh, he played quarterback in high school, uh, and he was one of the only actors that didn't really get to actually show that <laughs> athletic acumen. And I played in, in high school. I said this in the last pod, and then had a, I was an invited walk on to the University of Central Florida, and I said, yeah, man, I got you. I played wide receiver, but I could throw a football. Um, same, I think happened for Zach. They called you, asked you if you could throw. Yeah. Right? The, yeah. I mean, I could throw a football, but you know, I'm not a <laughs> state champion winning quarterback, especially in Texas, but neither was, I mean, Matt Saracen wasn't supposed to be. So sure, we, sure. we got down to Texas, like almost, I mean, when you shoot a pilot, it usually takes like three to three and a half weeks, which for anybody out there who's, who's not in the television industry, usually you shoot an episode of television in eight days or less. 
uh, unless you're on HBO, which, you know, you can have a, a bigger what they call board where they take the episode, they split it out and then they plan a schedule or a board where you're going to shoot these, these scenes on this really day. Boring I'm details. learning. No, no, no. I'm learning. Great. I'm like, this I've been is, doing this for no, 30 no, no, years. No, no, no. I, I, trust me on this one. I know I am the boring dad of the three of us. That's I true. get it. Uh, but so sometimes the show we takes shot, eight days to shoot. We shot our show. <laughs> Unlike other shows, on this show, we needed to go even extra, and so they did like a little football camp. We had a quarterback coach from Compton College come out, so I know myself and Zach, Gaius, Taylor, we were all out there on the football field with the stunt guys. How was Taylor? Two weeks. Taylor was great. He's a natural-born athlete. He's like an Adonis out there. I know that. He played played junior league hockey, uh, which is a big deal Right, Canada, and when he was in Texas, was actually in like a little semi-pro hockey league as well, which, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, insurance and the network weren't too happy about, but that's... You can't stop Taylor from doing anything. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to get it. Let's go, boys. It's mile 1,298. You're still new to this whole EV thing, but you're no longer totally freaked out. Because those range fears, yeah, totally overblown. Because your all-electric Hyundai Ionic 5 gets you to work and back all week on a single charge. And yeah, that fear about your charging times, ha, ha, ha. Because you can charge from 10 to 80% in as little as 18 minutes using a 350-kilowatt fast charger. See, this whole EV lifestyle is way easier than you imagined. Because you didn't just go electric. You went ionic. Strong choice, my friend. Which means you can save your freaking out for that late-night email that your boss just sent to your inbox. You should check it. But not until tomorrow, obviously. The Hyundai Ionic 5. When it comes to embracing change, we're thinking of every mile. Hyundai, it's your journey. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. 2023 Ionic 5 Rear Wheel Drive has an EPA-estimated driving range of up to 303 miles. Actual range will vary with options, driving conditions and habits, vehicle and batteries condition, and other factors. Available in limited quantities in select states only. Anybody who knows me knows I don't generally gravitate towards media that's like hopeful or inspirational. I'm like, I want to see murder. I want to feel sad. I don't want to feel hope. Don't make me feel hope. Did you want to see murder in this show? That's a spoiler. Stay tuned. I'm not ready to uh, go <laughs> you're there. Not, you're not Can't ready to go there yet. Can't wait for that episode, not, not by the way. Not ready to talk about Cannot that. wait for that episode. Uh, Lots of questions there. <laughs> but I feel like, you know, that's something that I was kind of struck by is how they've set this show up, you know. Um, and it's funny because we're kind of setting our show up. But I feel like something that is so interesting is being able to set up the show that there was this uh, urgency that, like what you're saying, that sort of could – it was a pressure and you could see how it could negatively affect the kids or how it was maybe going to affect them later on. But also so it sort of carried you through and somehow in this way that felt mostly positive that you were getting drawn into this story and the tension that was going along with the stakes of this game being so high. I mean, like, you know, it's it was just as exciting to me as some giant, you know, big budget whatever movie. Like the stakes were just as high somehow having that urgency drawn throughout the entire pilot. Yeah. Uh, and all those expectations from, you know, we were making something that I think from – Reading the script, the script read completely differently than any other pilot I've ever read. Um, Pete wrote such a like vicious, honest pilot. I have the original like script from when we auditioned, and it was like it wasn't originally Coach Taylor as Coach Long, and it wasn't originally Texas Forever. It was West Texas Forever. So a lot of things changed, but it was you know those edits as they came uh, were all great. But that initial like really raw, really honest, really fantastic place that Pete wrote from stuck with all of us who read the original pilot script to, to what ended up, you know, being on, on the show. Well, another interesting thing kind of on that same note, which I know, you know, from your work on Parenthood and everyone's heard us drone on about it, but you know, we got to go off script so much and Pete set that tone. And I'll never forget, like you get, you know, you get rewrites of scenes and stuff. And then back in the day, now they're in your email inbox, you would get them slipped under your um, hotel room door. And I read one and I said to Pete, I was like, dude, I think Matt's talking too much in this scene. Mm. And he said, what are you talking about? And I was like, he, the new pages? And he's like, oh, don't fucking read those. Those are for the studio. We're not going to shoot that. We're going to shoot what we want to shoot. <laughs> it's just for this, we're not going to shoot the fucking script. Don't That's even read it. Hilarious. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> this particular pilot, and I, we're going to get to it right now, um, you know, was just Pete Berg said from jump, nobody pushes us around. At the like launch dinner of the pilot, when we finally were done with all of our football camp 
and all of our, you know, training and, and all of our, you know, research and meetings with technical advisors and all this stuff uh, just for us, we might have thought it was a, like a long process of going down two weeks before you even start shooting. Uh, but they had been working on this thing for years and Pete knew what he wanted to tell. He knew the story that he wanted to tell. I have a quick question before yeah. you jump into this, which is just your numbers. Did you guys get to choose them? Did you not? How did that no, work? So that basically in the pilot, especially a lot of the football footage is um, used from uh, Pflugerville High School um, in their actual football games. So wow. our numbers were based on their players numbers wow. because they wanted that footage to match. As far as mine, I don't know because obviously the back we didn't use the backup. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how we all got our numbers, and I was really pumped because seven. I know it's generic, but it's my lucky number. Um, I don't know six. You liked it because it was Cutler. <laughs> no, oh my gosh, Jay Cutler. I cannot go into as a as a Bronco fan. The way he rode out of town was tough for me. Uh, that being said, um, it's not only football so let's let's avoid Moving the on. jay cutler talk yeah, sorry um you know no 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 it's all good what did you guys start with filming and how was like the chemistry on set between you guys as friends trying to remember that? i feel like the first stuff we filmed was practice day one uh i believe was the interviews that were done cool. uh which is something you see very early into the first mm -hmm. episode but before we get there uh let's let's put a pin in that we'll come back to that in just a minute let's just talk about the way the show opened you know most shows have like a cold open and a title sequence with this really catchy tune or whatever. Um, the Friday Night Lights pilot doesn't actually have the theme song in it. It just opens with a black screen and says Monday. Nothing but a black card that says Monday on it. Then you hear the voice of slamming Sammy Mead. He comes on the radio and he starts talking about all the pressure that's on Coach Taylor, how Dylan, the Dylan Panthers are the number one team in the state, um, how you've got, you know, Two players and well, it's such a genius Williams way to do expo like an exposition yeah. dump mm -hmm. because this is what exactly would be going on in that town, and you're setting up like here's where we are, here's who the characters are, here's the life situation they're in, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's you know it's completely organic. Yeah, and then it it starts to very quickly just establish the town. Now in the script, uh, it goes to Street's house. In the script, it goes uh, to a couple of other players' homes. In the script, it goes to Smash's house. Uh, and you go see everybody's house. But in the actual pilot that everybody watched, it's the Riggins household and that interesting family dynamic and Saracen's household. Did you film those things or did they just scrap them while you were filming? Like, did they film you guys going to your houses and then they just didn't use it? Or was that – did you never even shoot you going to your no, house? No, I mean you, you see like these little uh, scenes, uh, you know, I made you tuna fish sandwich – Two tuna fish sandwiches. Is that what it was in the in the show? You you. It shows oh. the first scene that you see between Zach and Luann, who played Grandma Saracen. Yes. And you get a very quick understanding of of who Saracen is. Right. And but I think May was asking like the scene that was in the script of you at your house on that first day that wasn't in the, the final episode. Did you film it or no? Oh no, I I don't. We never filmed that. Got it. Uh, it was in the it was in the pilot script. Uh, but you know, over time things changed, things morphed and the fine, you know, finally the day we got there, they decided to just scrap that. We didn't actually shoot it. Uh, it was, it was something interesting. They, they had an uncanny knack to figure out what needed to be told and what didn't. Right. And that's something that's a theme over the course of the show is that sometimes a storyline will be presented and you won't get an ending to it that character will just kind of disappear yeah we had that on parenthood a lot yeah. we got a lot of feedback of like what happened to that guy that she was basically married to and then this is yeah. completely gone and we but were if, like don't worry about it if they thought something was not necessary and they never talked down to the audience we always trusted the audience to just keep up i guess you know and because of the way they shot the show which was within a football season you know the entire season one of friday night lights so was in smart. a football season and they they didn't stick with you in the spring or the summer we just came back, back. which know. was also a funny thing because I remember, you know, shooting yeah. the pilot. I thought, oh, cool. Me and Jess Landry were sophomores and Scott's a senior. Taylor's a senior. Guy's a senior. And so we filmed that dynamic where it's like, I'm two years younger than them. Blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, we come back season two. It's like, oh, oh, Taylor's still here. Guy? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was just one year younger than them. Cool, cool, cool. Um, season three. Oh, we're all, we, we're, we're the here? same. We're peers. So I'm just super like subservient. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. yeah well. But in that whole opening, it, it's all – you just – you know it's Monday. You meet Saracen. You meet his grandma, which that scene is 
so lovely. Yeah. What's she, what was it like working with her? Because that relationship that you guys had together was something I think that everybody just it like broke everybody's hearts. She is one of my favorite people in the whole world. I Mine mean, too. she literally over the course of the season would bring me newspaper clippings from Dallas where she lived. If oh. like my picture was in it or if I was mentioned and Weird. we hit it off real quick and you know I loved her my grandmother would always say she'd be like he's so nice to his grandmother because I taught him to be nice to his grandmother <laughs> I'm like yeah 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 That's sure so sure not um but yeah no she was just the best and now even to this day it's like the last time I saw her was a few years ago and we just started crying like wow. and hugging each other Aww. um like we zoomed about a year ago for like a interview thing and we both like started tearing up we're like cool cool we'll get to the interview i was like hold on let me go grab my kid you've never met and like brought them on screen and she's just like the most amazing woman wow you can tell that relationship is something special by the way that she says you i adore and and there's this amount of space in there that i think very quickly let the viewer know that there was going to be a lot of breath in this show and, and by that, I mean there was going to be a lot of times when characters weren't talking. They were just sharing. Which is so rare on network television. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that she's a perfect example of one of the things that was special about our show because she was like a Dallas actress. And so many so many um, people on the show who became major characters were locals or extras who we gave a line. And they were like, you're interested. Not we, but the producers and writers were like, that's a really interesting person and they're good. So they gave them more lines and more lines and then they would have story arcs. And I think – it gave it that authenticity of feeling like it was actually in some small town Texas because it wasn't just a bunch of L.A. or New York actors, you know, pretending. Yeah. Hey, check this out. I want to try. Jesus. When it comes to the long haul, we're thinking of every mile. The all-electric Hyundai Ioniq 5. It's your journey. And I mean, I think, you know, in the then kind of moving through when the, you're having these interviews and the whatnot, is, as, and it's all sort of football-centric in the beginning, I thought it was a really interesting uh, way, device to then have show you guys kind of at your, like, high school hang, sort of after you had this brief, like, inter- introduction, and you kind of talked about football, and you talked about a little bit of their home uh, life, and her, then it showed you guys at the diner yeah, or whatever Yeah, what was that? Do you remember what it was called? I called it the Peach Pit, but I know that was... Uh, it was called Easy's, and unfortunately, let's all pour one <laughs> out for Easy's. That, that diner... Where the Aztec bur- all that stuff happens. Oh, yeah. uh, it was called Easy's. It's unfortunately burnt down a couple of years oh ago and has not been rebuilt. So uh, pouring out for Easy's. That's where we went after. Uh, we watched the pilot all together because I had my brother and sister with me. They weren't of age, so they couldn't go to a bar. And so I went with uh, with Amy Teagarden and Jesse hmm. Plemons, who were also underage. I uh, went to a bar. Yeah, he went to a bar. By yourself. Uh, we, my family, and, and we all went <laughs> to, to Easy's. Uh, <laughs> None of the other cats wanted to they hang out with like, me. They were like, we're going to go to Easy's. You, you know, it's like... That whole interview process was such a brilliant way to though, establish like the rivalry between Smash and Riggins. The the race relations are queued up with a question by an interviewer, you know, from NBC who's been following the team around and all that stuff. And then that continues on into this scene at the diner, uh, which was a lot of fun because we're all there at the same time, mm-hmm. really building these relationships offset as well as on because we all lived in like the same apartment complex. I kid you not, like we almost all lived in this one apartment complex. We were all next door neighbors, including Kyle and Connie. Like for the, the I was greater... there for about two weeks on Scott's couch, and I was like, I'm not living around. Yeah, all. Zach was the only <laughs> Zach was like, I moved no. to the other side of town, I and smart. I love everyone. I was like, I don't know. I bet there was some juicy, juicy stuff happening in that little apartment complex <laughs> I mean, that we'll get to later. You know, a crewmers episode. It was a show with a bunch of crewmers. kids, and you those know. are crew rumors. <laughs> I, I, <yeah. laughs> Um, but, uh, but that scene, I, as I was watching it, it's great. It is what it is. Uh, I just kept on going, what is happening with my hair? <laughs> I love oh, it. Oh, 100%. That's... Mine too. <laughs> oh my God, you guys. Remember the part where I said you guys didn't have egos? I was just Well, kidding. no, looking back at it, but you're like, I, I genuinely had that thought. I was like, oh my God, who let me have that haircut? I'm like, well, it's like middle Texas and, you know. I didn't 2000s. even notice either of your hair and I'm usually quite stressed by those details so I just, I want you guys to take comfort in that. I, Scott know. looked like, I literally wrote in my notes, Scott looks like Superman. I <laughs> Scott does look like Superman. No, I know, but like. I had, I had been doing this musical comedy about a struck, struggling Christian boy band 
in New York City for about a year called Alter Boys. And I had long blonde hair. Oh, he had like like frosted tips. Yeah, it was like a Bieber cut before Bieber was around. And it came down and had this little like swoop in the – it was down across my forehead. And so when we came down for football camp, like hair and makeup told me, don't let anybody touch your hair. Don't cut it. (laughs) Don't do anything. We're going to make the decision for you. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So I'm there in football camp, and Coach Graff, the the stunt coordinator who did Deadwood and a ton of other football films, he's like, you know, he he won a national championship, I think, at USC way back in the days. You know, football. This this guy's a lifer. He looks like a, a walrus or Andy Reid. And then we're in the stunt room, and he's introducing us to all the stunt guys that are going to be playing our, our stunt doubles. Kevin Reed, who was my stunt double. He played at the University of Central Florida. I mean, this guy was very talented. That was street stunt double. Uh, and Coach Graff looks at the four of us that he's got standing there, and he's like, hey, everybody, this is, uh, this is uh, Zach Guilford, uh, Gaius, J- Gaius Charles, Taylor Kitchen, Scott Porter. And uh, I think we're going we're gonna to try to make him look like a football player. He says as he's like looking at me with my Justin Bieber haircut. They found my double. They literally because they had this whole football team of ex football players. Um, they all played college football. Somewhere yeah, in a lot of them for a minute. But um, for my double, they were like, uh, "Who's the smallest white guy we have?" <laughs> yeah, I know this. The stunt double world is so co- comedic. Every time you have like a stunt, and when you're an actor, mm-hmm. and then you see sort of what they think the most you looks like. I mean, the amount of times mine's either always like a young boy or like a very <laughs> old woman. It's a uh, it's a classic thing that happens every time. I'm like, yeah, there uh, there it is. So I, I I'm curious too. Just I know you guys talked about how there was um, you took a lot of footage from actual football games, uh, but how much like of the actual football in the practice and all that stuff did you actually play? Like all the practicing and the stuff. I think we did a lot stuff. more at the beginning mm-hmm. because they streamlined yeah. it and they figured out, you know, we all had no egos where, you know, if there was a throw that I could hit five out of ten times, mm-hmm. I knew my double could hit it nine out of ten times. And I don't want to waste people's time trying yeah. to prove I can make a throw. And they very quickly realized like, oh, we can shoot so many much of this while Zach or Scott or whoever is off shooting another scene somewhere and we'll right. shoot just football stuff and then we'll pop in and just shoot his eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it became very little at the end, but we all, because we all were athletes, we all like to jump in and do as much as we they let us. Because yeah. one other thing about that you mentioned about the the fil- the way that you filmed the show, which I think is really important to set up, is something that we did on Parenthood as well, which is the three camera setup. Which usually, just for those listening at home, a lot of the times, especially with network television, they'll sort of do a wide shot where you see everything, and then they'll pop in for coverage and they'll do two cameras looking at the same person, sometimes the same shot, sometimes just a little bit different or a, li- a medium, and then a really close one. And it's it's so time consuming. And on top of it, then you have to turn around where they put the cameras to look at the other person in the conversation and I find that you know it can be an hour and they're setting up the lighting and you don't remember what you did on one side and the thing and it can sort of like distort the reality but you know something that we did on Parenthood that I think makes it so special that I know you guys did too is shooting three cameras at once uh, once, which not only makes it go so fast but you also get real reactions in real time of what's actually being fed to you so like you were saying about having to be so present with everything when you have this setup you're listening you're responding you're a where so that was something that you guys did pretty much all the time i mean we did on parenthood almost everything with three cameras and i think it it's what allowed us to shoot so much and to have the time to be able to try different things and actually focus on the acting as opposed to just getting the shot and moving on i mean was that did you guys mostly film all your you know human stuff with three cameras everything yeah everything we never didn't have and it got to the point that we didn't even know where the cameras were we did the same thing they were like they'd be in the oven or like yeah (laughs) but that's how you get all these really cool moments where you know when in the in the pilot especially like we were kind of like feeling it out but the further you get down into the line of the series you're going to see a lot of like really 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 tight close-ups where you only see like the eye of a character Mm. or like you know and and that's just the third camera keeping itself out of everybody else's shot, basically, mm-hmm. and just coming in and getting the closest human reaction that they can. Mm-hmm. And so often it, it played for this particular show. Um, but like when we're talking about football, there'd be six cameras up and running at once wow. so that these guys wouldn't have to take too many hits. But in the pilot, uh, before we even get to the diner, there's there's that uh, really famous scene where Riggins has been drunk and – He's been fumbling the ball and everything in practice, and Coach Taylor makes him stand in the middle of the ring, mm-hmm. and he gives this famous speech about, you know, four days from now, 
a group of men are going to come down here and try and embarrass you in front of your fathers, your mothers, your brothers and sisters. And he's calling out numbers and all of these stunt guys are hitting one of Riggins' stunt doubles. Mm-hmm. Riggins had like three stunt doubles. Uh, his main one throughout the course of the series is named Eric Smart. He had played at Texas Tech. Uh, really, really talented athlete. But uh, that scene was brutal. And we that was the first like – big hits that were happening on the show because we hadn't even shot a game yet. But that's when I was out there that day and just watching that violence was some of that stuff was, was really hard hitting. I think it comes across in the show really, really well. And it also, it also helped to establish like the expectations again of what this town expects from these young men and women. Yeah. And the song black Betty's playing underneath it the whole time, but we'll move further into the pilot episode unless we have, well, the, I think it's all part of it, but <coughs> you okay? I'm going to live. God. Um, I think just, you know, one thing I was struck by, and this does kind of pervade the entire episode, so it sort of goes with it. But like you said, the expectations of these kids that, you know, yeah, you guys were a million years old, but they were you were high schoolers on the show to uh, expect that from high schoolers, that level of pressure and all of that, I think that that's something that I was really struck by. And I think that kind of adds to the brutality of the entire show. And I think it it kind of pervades the entire thing and is sort of just really important. And did you feel, I mean, the fact that this is all leading up to this one game and the urgency and the pressures that were on this, these kids in this way, you know, in a personal life and in like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the football game. I mean, how, how did you guys like create that sense of urgency? Because what happens after the rest of the, you have the interviews, you have the practice. Yeah. That, that whole practice, all the interviews, uh, Reagan's getting his ass handed to him. That's all Monday. Yeah. And I think the urgency of the show really ramps up because they go, okay, that was one day. Now we're on Tuesday and we're, we're, we're four days out from game day. And that day you start to really see some of the home lives of some of the characters that you weren't interested, uh, introduced to on, on day one. So you see Lila Garrett's family and what she does, how, what, what her part I to play is. Went, I forgot that Buddy was Lila's dad. Yeah. I know, <laughs> Buddy. Um, but you meet, you know, Buddy Garrity and you start to understand, oh, it's not only the kids that have the pressure, uh, it's the coaches as well. You know, on Tuesday, you also get a scene where coach Taylor is, is in the office watching film and Tammy comes in. She's like, Hey, how you doing? And he's like, man, I'm, you know, I'm scared about this game. These guys are fast. They're really big. This is going to be tough. And she says, you know, I heard an ugly rumor that we have to be somewhere tomorrow night (laughs) or, or no, it's tonight. We have to be somewhere tonight. And he's like, what are you talking about? She's like, we got to go to a, some, rally at a car dealership and and you start to very quickly understand that like it's not just the kids that that have the pressure on them that there are these former players and other people that live in the town that expect nothing but greatness out of this team and uh you know that takes us to the car dealership and 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 a lot of really cool stuff and i'll make you jealous real quick (laughs) pretty much that whole night taylor and i spent hiding in in the back of that suv in the middle of the set what were you doing back (laughs) there trying to stay off camera (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's really smart. I mean, because it's sort of, I don't know if we want to talk about where the, the name of this show came from, because I don't know what day that occurred. Do you know what day that was on, Scott? Where 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 part of we got the name of this, of It's Not Only Football, that yeah, conversation? That also happens on, on Tuesday. It's so much happens on uh, on Tuesday, uh, where he gets to talk to Coach Deeks and, and everything about, like, you know, the pressures on his family. And he's like, how's the family doing? And Coach Taylor says, well, you know, we're all, we're all fine right now. You know, we're all, we're all doing good. And his coach, who was a scout, the, the, the idea for those who don't watch football, uh, the idea is that we have coaches on the staff that go to watch practices for other teams. And he's gone down and seen these kids. And he comes back and he's like, this is going to be tough. How's the family doing? He said, we're doing fine. And he goes, well, that's not going to last. And he's like, "What? What do you mean? It's, it's it's only football." And they have this really hearty laugh about it because it's it's, it's not only it's, football. Yeah, it's not just it's not just a sport. <laughs> it is it is life to these people in this town. And actually, I, I may be uh, I may be wrong when that scene happens, but uh, but I'll, I'll figure it out. But uh, we start to really see, you know, these characters, you know, that aren't just on the team. Though we meet Mayor. The mayor of the yeah. town, uh, Mayor Rydell, uh, played by a brilliant actress, too. And that's where Pete really started to play with all of us is that car dealership that night, as scripted, is very 
like cut and dry little scenes, but the way he cut everything together, he wanted just all of us to be on our toes. So, you know, the mayor asked, you know, the mayor's telling Jason street, you know, you're, you're a really kind boy. You're real polite. And he's like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She's like, stop, cut it out. And then Pete would come and whisper things in actors ears. And she's like, do you listen to black Sabbath? And I was like, what? And she's like, they'll make you mean. I was like, that, that wasn't necessarily scripted, but that was like another piece of, uh, Pete's brilliance. Do you That's remember Pete. anything? I don't there, to be honest. I mean, I just remember like in the diner, just Pete making Jesse just house a cheeseburger and kept being like, shove another bite in your mouth. Take another bite. <laughs> but there's like a thousand of those that are going to come up. Um, Tuesday. Mm. Yeah. Tuesday was a long day. I mean, I mean, Tuesday, you mentioned, you mentioned Landry, uh, there's this amazing scene where Landry is talking about this imaginary crossword puzzle. And he's like, starts with S, 13 letters, Satan's oh, yeah. horns. That's what I see come out of Street's mom's head every time a Notre Dame scout comes around. And meanwhile, Luann's on the porch and she looks over and she goes, Matt? You need a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> Iconic. Yeah. And, and I don't know, you know, again, I wasn't. Working that day, so I don't. I don't remember actually if that was scripted. I think oh, it no, was. It all, I mean, I remember the scene. There, there was so much of it was just like he would keep giving Jesse stuff to say, and I was just. I mean, you'll if, when we watch the show, like my face is not on it a lot if I'm in a scene with Jesse because I could not keep a straight face. He's a star. He's. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Academy Award nominated. Thank you. Um, yeah, but it was just a blast. I, it was really kind of crazy going back and watching it and remember some of the things. We we're like, oh, I totally forgot that, and some we we're like, yeah. I'll never forget that moment. Yeah. But people who are watching the show and like, you know, it's this drama, but there's so many uh, pieces of, of levity in it. Um, there's that wonderful scene where the the real estate agent uh, is hitting on Tim Riggins. All right, it's like, what is a blitz? I have you ever blitzed an old woman? <laughs> You could, you know, <laughs> like he's like, it, no, and, and there's so many times I found myself laughing watching this, uh, this episode again that I, I didn't remember because my character takes a pretty dark turn pretty quickly, but there is so much humor in it all too. I was going to say, well, that won't last just, uh, to quote, uh, coach Deeks. And oh, I think that's, is that's that... my favorite. Oh yeah. no, wait, never mind. Sorry. What? No, it was a different one. You were quoting the right person. I'll them. save mine for later. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Go that's ahead. great. I just I mean, cut you off. It's so this weird. is the this is our relationship. We cut each other off. But I mean, that's kind of right. That's the end of Tuesday. What's our plan for the structure of these? We're kind of copying the pilot, aren't we? A little bit here for this. Yeah, I mean, I just figured we'd jump in and just kind of give each day its due. I guess in the pilot, at least. Um, but obviously, there's so much that we want to talk about. Uh, within the confines of this episode that I think, you know, maybe we'll get halfway through and then we'll, maybe we'll wrap it up here. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, we've got, listen, we the, preambled a lot about a lot of stuff. We did. Now we we've did. been rambling. You know, it's the end of how, how Tuesday ends. Yeah. There's, there's a lot that happens on Tuesday. So I feel like we can finish with that and then pick up on, you know, Midweek, yeah, hump day. sounds good. Uh, the Pee Wee football game, I Don't guess. Don't say hump day. That, but that's that's what they call it. <laughs> I know, but no, pod is enough. Calling it a pod is. I've already let that happen. I'm not going to let hump day become a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. On. All right, we'll start midweek. <laughs> Love that midweek. Okay, uh, but if there was anything else in those first couple of days that we want to talk about, I do think that we should put that all to rest. Um, you know, it's just. There's one scene I wanted to talk about in particular that also happens at, at this point in time, and it's it's late afternoon, early evening in the Taylor household, and it's where you first start to realize that Coach and Tammy Taylor are quite possibly the greatest married couple that has ever existed uh, on television. And having been married for a decade now, like I see going back and watching, I'm like, oh yeah, they there is so much honesty in the way they communicate with each other the shorthand that they have between each other, uh, Connie and Kyle, you know, they road tripped actually together from California to Texas, just to spend time together to kind of learn each other's actual wow. shorthand so they could apply it all. Uh, and, and there's a scene where she's wanting a house. She wants a bigger house. They've, you know, he's just been appointed this job. They're kind of living out of boxes, not sure where they're going to end up. And it's a scene about his and her closets. As he's sitting there trying to watch film while his daughter is also trying to talk to him about Moby Dick. the book she's reading in school, Moby Dick, and calling him Coach Ahab, basically. And in this scene, Tammy's talking to him. Uh, you know, Julie is talking to him. and He turns to Tammy Taylor and he says one word. And do you remember what that one word is? 
Alaska? No. no. In the in the pilot script, it's Alaska. You're right. It yes. In the script, I just watched Alaska, it. <laughs> uh, he Me turns too. to her and he goes, "Relent." Oh yes, yes, yes. Mm. Like he's he's got so much on his plate already, but it it shows again that it's not just about that game. It's about their life. Where are they living? Where do, where are their dreams taking them? Where is her? Where is her dream? Where does that ultimately lie? Um, how do they support? this family, you know, and it's, and it's such a beautiful look into the home of the coach and, and, and the life that they're trying to live. And you, you meet Julie Taylor at the diner you were talking about earlier, and you can see that her dreams have nothing to do with what her dad does. And she hates I, you. <laughs> so it's not like me, She's but so she'll, she'll come around. Spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> um, but that scene is also where Tammy's in the background and she's just his and her closets and she does that little dance away that ended up in the credits oh man i wish you all could see the amy scott's dance (laughs) guess what we're not only on audio if you are listening to this and you'd like to uh, actually see our faces and uh you know kind of get a look at how embarrassed uh zach guilford can get sometimes (laughs) uh you can tune in on video as well but yeah i feel like you know you also get a, a strong characterization from tyra which we haven't talked about today adrian palicki is so fantastic She's in Monday. She's kind of flirting or actually waking up on the couch with Riggins. Tuesday, she's flirting with Smash. But you can get the sense that she's not part of a normal love triangle. She's just doing what she wants to do. She's empowering herself. And that's so often the story of people in Dillon, Texas, trying to find where they have their own power and how they can take control of their own lives. Uh, is there anything else from, from that day that you all want to kind of cover? No, and I think as we think on it, we can always you know, bring it back up as we're going through things. But – no, I think that's true. I think the kind of one of the running themes is that all the characters that we follow and we fall in love with, it's because they're not just the person who only cares about football. Like there's some other drive within them or football's like their ends to a means and they understand that and we feel for them because of that. Um, or how does it intersect with their lives? How does it affect their lives? Wow, exactly. even if they don't want it, they're thrust into it, like Julie or you know, it's sort of like that's kind of the mainstay of this town and then it's sort of how does it affect everybody's lives and how do they balance out, like you're saying, their hopes and dreams and their aspirations with sort of this like blanket of football that lays over the town, you know? Yeah, because it's not only football. It's guys, I just want to say it is not only football. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we have just And neither is this podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm Mae Whitman, and I'm not on Friday Night Lights, but I should have been. You, you would have been a welcome addition. I'm Zach Gelford. Thanks, babe. Uh, I am Scott Porter, and as we were talking about aspirations, uh, we can't wait to take you through this journey of Friday Night Lights along with us. Uh, as you can tell, we're not only people who are involved in the show, but huge fans just like you all out there. Uh, we can't take, wait to talk further with you, and we're not going to be doing it just the three of us all the time. We're going to have some guests on. Uh, who have some other really interesting perspectives, whether it's being a part of filming or sharing something that they did on the show that we aren't familiar with or being a part from, of the multiverse yeah, <laughs> or somebody from outside of the Kadams verse that was just affected by the show as everybody else uh, out there listening, hopefully was. Uh, we will be back next Thursday. And our plan was at the beginning of this episode to maybe end on Wednesday so we could start Thursday on Thursday. But now we're going to start Wednesday on Thursday and everybody's going to be super confused, including the hosts. We can't wait to see you, though, next week on It's Not Only Football, Friday Night Lights and beyond. Thank you all. Peace. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to It's Not Only Football, Friday Night Lights, and Beyond. You can download, subscribe, and chat with us at Rate and Review over at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to watch, you can find us on the official It's Not Only Football channel on YouTube. Reach out and let us know if there's anything you'd love for us to talk about, anything we missed today, or any questions you have for the future as we go on this journey. Thank you again for listening. We'll see you next Thursday.